Tim, we owe you a, a great debt of gratitude because uh, not only did you chair the House's Committee on AI in the last session, but you actually proposed the setting up of this uh, Committee on uh, AI and Weapons Systems. Tell, give me a, a feeling for why you did that, why you felt this was coming to the top of the agenda. Well, I'd uh, chaired the uh, AI Select Committee a few years beforehand, and that, but by and large, was about civil uh, uses for artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, one of the things we concluded was that the risk of autonomous uh, lethal weapons enabled by AI, uh, you know, was a major risk, but we didn't really have time to go into it that much. Uh, we looked at a number of other uses and applications, but defense was an area where we said there should be a separate um, study. Uh, and so, of course, the logical thing was uh, a few years down the track, especially now with the uh, defense AI strategy coming out from the government, uh, we thought, well, now is the time uh, to apply for a, a, a new inquiry specifically on autonom autonomous weapon systems. And I'm glad to say that the, uh, the, the authorities in the House agreed to it. Well, one of the things um, is that we've tried to do, as, as you know, is we've tried to be very careful to limit our inquiry because the moment you go into broader questions of AI, things are really very difficult to control in terms of subject. But uh, autonomous weapons, um, what was your understanding when we started as to what an autonomous weapon was? And where is your understanding now? I think it's pretty much in the same place. I think the problem was that there wasn't a definition out there that the government accepted. I found it rather paradoxical that they knew what autonomous was, and they could define that, and they knew uh, pretty much uh, what a weapon was. But that what they weren't prepared to say is, this is our definition of an autonomous weapon system. And uh, during a course of our uh, committee inquiry, of course, uh, and uh, you know, in our report, uh, we uh, actually do specify that and we say that the government um, uh, should come up with a definition. And my definition is that effectively is weapon systems which can select, detect and engage targets with little or no uh, human involvement. And in practice, because of the sophistication needed, they're going to be AI enabled. And that's the link with AI, basically. And if you have a generally accepted definition, presumably it is easier, it should be easier, to achieve another of our recommendations, which is to have some sort of international agreement and regulation of these weapons. Absolutely. And uh, of course, in a sense, uh, people um, uh, uh, forget that this could be a continuum. We already have international humanitarian law. And the next step in terms of deciding how we uh, 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 treat these weapons for all the purposes of international humanitarian law, you know, is something that uh, a group of nations uh, can agree on. So I think, you know, we, we're, we, we can head in the right direction, but what it needs is, is positive policy uh, by the government uh, to ensure that. So, and I, of course, the committee goes into some detail on all of that. So uh, um, why do you think, though, Robert, that it's important to look at this? I mean, obviously, you came in, and I'm delighted that you chaired uh, the committee. Um, and we've got a report, I think, that uh, we can all be, you know, very positive about and uh, uh, is very persuasive in its conclusions. But uh, why do you think that uh, uh, what we've done is important? Well, I think for a lot of people, um, it is a subject of concern, but it's also a subject of some obscurity. And one of the things that select committees are really brilliant at doing is uh, resting their conclusions and their recommendations on evidence. So that in an ideal select committee, and uh, we were pretty ideal, I thought, in terms of the commitment of members and the uh, experience and expertise that they brought to the subject, um, is that people leave their prejudices outside the door of the committee room. And I felt also that um, select committees do have this great uh, feature, which is that they allow uh, direct engagement with the parliamentary process. What goes on in the chamber, in a sense, goes on in a bubble. But uh, we took, as you know, a huge amount of evidence. And I think that that is really important in getting a range of uh, views 
in front of the committee, in front of Parliament. But it is also, and this I felt was particularly important, um, to provide a, an impartial and a carefully considered platform for debate because everybody on the spectrum of views about uh, AWS, everybody's got their view, but you can't really discuss that in any detail unless you've got some givens. And what we've been trying to do is to use uh, outside expertise and our own judgment to, uh, as it were, set the conditions for public debate, for engagement, and if the government wants to go down this road, and we think they should, for engagement in order to have some sort of democratic accountability, but democratic endorsement as well. I, I think I was very impressed by uh, the sheer uh, internationalism, if you like, of, of the evidence uh, and the fact that we had people from all over the world, uh, 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 in a sense, coming to our door and informing us. Uh, uh, and obviously, that forms the evidence, very powerful evidence, that informs our report. Absolutely, and uh, technology was working for us as well because when you've got that number of uh, overseas witnesses, um, all you have to worry about is time zones. And, uh, uh, and I think there was an exchange with one in Australia about the outcome of the ashes, but apart from that. Um, <laughs> so uh, it meant that we could draw on a really wide um, spectrum of opinion, uh, of expert evidence, and it was, it was wide. Um, there was no way that somebody on one end of the spectrum, as it were, was going to agree 100% with somebody on the other end. But what we've been able to do is to, uh, we hope, and I think our report shows it, to ask the key questions, to get people to uh, go on the record with their, with their views, and to set them out in a way which, just returning to my earlier point, um, should make the basis for informed public debate and engagement. When we um, embarked on the inquiry, I think there were quite a few areas which were quite mysterious. Um, certainly when we went through the various elements which now form part of our report and our recommendations, uh, I knew very little about international humanitarian law. I knew very little about how the practicalities of targeting work on the battlefield, or indeed how regulated the battle space is. Uh, what were the things that really struck you as, uh, during our inquiry? Well, I agree absolutely with you, Robert. I'm a lawyer, but what I knew about international humanitarian law, you could write on the back of a postage stamp. Um, I knew quite a bit about the technical aspects. So the unreliability of, of AI systems, uh, the data, uh, uh, that it uses being potentially biased, those, those kinds of risks, I absolutely understood about uh, uh, AI um, and, you know, in a sense, its contribution to uh, the autonomy of uh, autonomous weapon systems. Um, but the bits that I did not understand were uh, how that fitted into uh, international humanitarian law or didn't fit into humanitarian uh, international humanitarian law, uh, a lot about the way the military, in a sense, uh, deploys weaponry, uh, uh, treats uh, uh, weaponry, and the kind of guardrails that, as a matter of course, they're expected to uh, have uh, in, you know, for instance, military doctrine uh, with uh, uh, military necessity, for instance, where um, you have to be able to distinguish between civilians and military, uh, where you have to engage in a proportional way and so on. I uh, uh, had no idea about, you know, in a sense, what the regime that uh, governs the use of weapons was. So, um, uh, and in many ways, actually, I was reassured that we had um, a way of discussing this, which uh, in a way, um, gave us um, uh, 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 the ability to make recommendations in the future uh, uh, so that AWS is not seen as something completely out with the ordinary course. It, it's something where we can make sure uh, that it is uh, properly within international humanitarian law and we can have agreements internationally on the use of them. So this isn't like, you know, the Terminator suddenly arriving. Uh, you know, we've actually got, um, we've got the wherewithal to handle it.
Um, there were two things that, um, as they came up, worried me, and let's see whether they worried you as well. I suspect they did. One was the um, possibility of rogue states or non-state actors using AI-enabled weaponry, uh, whether fully autonomous or not. Um, and the other was procurement. Now, taking the uh, non-state actors and rogue states first, one of the things that really did concern me and continues to concern me actually is that uh, it is a very difficult thing to control. If it's a state which will put its interests into the common pool of regulation, that's one thing. But if it is somebody who just doesn't give a damn about it, uh, it's very difficult to regulate. If you're talking about nuclear weapons, well, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with um, uh, enriched uranium, you can see the plant for doing that from space. Uh, if you're dealing with AI, then it could just be, you know, a, a barn somewhere. Uh, and I think that that is going to be a challenge as things go on. But I was very glad that we actually opened that particular box to have a, have a look inside. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, I think that's where, in a sense, you can absolutely draw the line in terms of nuclear weaponry. And I think we were absolutely right to do so. The thought of um, uh, having autonomy surrounding nuclear weapons in terms of targeting and decision making and so on, uh, command and control, uh, uh, is, is horrifying. So I think getting that off the table um, hopefully by international agreement, I think is absolutely crucial. But you're so right about the delivery in other ways, in the non-nuclear, in the conventional weapon area. And one of the reasons why I got concerned about AWS was again the whole area of drone warfare, which of course is more and more now uh, the case. And we don't quite know the level of autonomy, for instance in Ukraine, uh, uh, um, in Syria and so on historically. I think they f were first used in Libya actually. Um, so, uh, you know, the level of autonomy in those drones and the ability to build those uh, autonomous weapons relatively cheaply means that proliferation is, is a big thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't establish you know, what the key uh, considerations are under international humanitarian law. Absolutely. And if we have parameters and standards which are internationally agreed, we hope, by uh, a considerable number of states, then it is, uh, as it were, easier to uh, identify and, we hope, to deal with activity which happens outside those parameters, doesn't measure up to those standards. One thing which I uh, was alarmed about and it's interesting to watch the uh, passage of events and as time goes on, more uh, capable AI and self-learning AI and how that might affect weapon systems. Yes, I mean, this is a real issue. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, the, if you like, the availability of these large language models, uh, universal availability more and more. They're not just things that are procured by governments or big corporates. Um, they are in the hands of uh, ordinary people now. And when you're there open source, then it means that you're able to piggyback on the very, very powerful uh, models that are developed. And some of them are open source currently, some of them are not. But it does, you know, in, in, for the sake of greater competition, and this is the, the case that people make for open source AI, uh, for the sake of greater competition, we are finding, I think, that the security issues are going to loom larger and larger with the ability to piggyback, bad actors to piggyback on some of these uh, large language models and these generative AI, frontier AI, uh, sometimes they're described as. So, yes, I, I, I mean, that concerns me as well. But, uh, the, and again, what we have to do is try and make sure that states behave uh, uh, in the appropriate way uh, and that therefore there is an agreement that we try and eliminate the use by bad actors uh, of, of these weapons. But then, you know, we can't always uh, 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 guarantee that, but at least the start is by making sure we know what conforms to international humanitarian law and what doesn't. Yes, I mean, this was a, a theme, safety, was a theme of the government's AI summit and is reflected in the Bletchley Declaration. But of course, that's aspirational. And there is quite a long distance between the aspiration and delivering the reality. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm really interested in, in the outcomes of Bletchley. Um, if it 
if it is productive, of course, but there's no harm in talking about risk, but they did tend to talk about existential risk rather than the here and now. But you can't talk about risk without talking about mitigation and making sure that the vulnerabilities are dealt with. Well, that really hasn't been dealt with. And I think that's why our report is important because we're looking at some of the key vulnerabilities and the key risks, and we're actually making very important suggestions to mitigate. Absolutely, and the title of our report, Proceed with Caution, in a sense, distills that exactly. Let's, let's just have a word about procurement, because that was one of the themes that we teased out in some detail. Um, the Ministry of Defence's procurement processes are famously, um, shall we say, suboptimal, and stuff arrives late, it costs much, much more than it was originally intended to cost, and um, AI seems to hold the promise, or perhaps the threat, of changing the timescales very profoundly. Whereas if you wanted a new frigate or a new uh, fighter aircraft, the, the gleam in the eye might be 30 years before delivery, and it gets worked through and the operational requirement gets amended and so on. But AI is going to be, uh, or a new autonomous weapon, might be developed very, very quickly. Yes. And the, the thing which worried me and continues to do so, because I think the Ministry of Defence needs to put serious amounts of resource into repowering its procurement processes, uh, is the possibility that um, instead of the Ministry of Defence saying, this is what we want, this is what it's got to be able to do, oh, uh, industrial firm, can you deliver it? You will find AI developers coming to the Ministry of Defence and saying, well, we've got this WISO new system, do you want it? And the Ministry of Defence, it seems to me, has got to be able to uh, analyse and to evaluate those offers. And uh, it was a worry, I think, for the whole committee that at the moment it didn't really seem to have the resources to do that because it can't attract the top talent. No, absolutely. And they didn't have uh, the skills in-house to evaluate and uh, procure properly. I mean, absolutely agree with you. And also, I think there's, there's an approach, which is you've got to be agile, you've got to be adaptable, um, particularly because a lot of AI is dual use as well. So you're not just talking about a, a weapon that looks like a weapon. I mean, a drone, for instance, and we've seen this in Ukraine. I mean, basically uh, adapting uh, civilian drones for military purposes um, is exactly what they've been doing. I mean, to very good effect, um, uh, which does mean, therefore, that the uh, military procurement has to really understand what is out there and what can be adapted for military use. Uh, and uh, where to draw the line on autonomy and so on for uh, military purposes. So, uh, you know, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is, I think, an ongoing aspect. And I think when the government responds, which they will have to, I think the uh, usual thing is within two months or whatever of our report, um, but when they respond, I think the thing that we will be kicking the tires very heavily on is the whole procurement area. Because historically, uh, as we both know, uh, government's procurement has not been a happy uh, situation, even for conventional weapons. And one of the things that they will have to demonstrate, or contractors will have to demonstrate, is their understanding of the ethical dimensions and their ability to deliver through life support because weapons, or at least the enablers of weapons, are going to be developing all the time. Absolutely. And of course, one of the things we examine is the new ethics advisory panel that the government has set up. Um, and, you know, it sounds good and we're told about it in the course of uh, the government telling us about the principles that are going to be adopted for the deployment and uh, uh, development of uh, AWS. Uh, as part of its defense AI strategy. But actually, when we looked further, we found that, well, actually, the Ethics Advisory Panel hadn't been uh, consulted uh, on, the, on anything to do with AWS yet. And you'd have thought that that was the point, you know, really, where they would have been brought in as the first line advisors on the ethics to be adopted. So uh, I think there's many a slip here between cup and lip. I think we've got to 
um, uh, you know, uh, keep on top of this uh, and, and try and make sure that they do deliver in that ethical promise that they said they would. And it will be presumably also a key element of engaging with the public, of winning public confidence in the fact that we have these weapons. We don't yet, and we, as the Ministry of Defence says, um, we do not have fully autonomous weapons, although as they do not have uh, a definition, it's a little <laughs> difficult to define what you don't have. Yes. Um, but if there is a very firm basis in international humanitarian law and in the ethical considerations, it seems to me that's going to be key to uh, winning public confidence and retaining it. Absolutely. And of course, one of the interesting aspects uh, during our committee discussions was, well, how do we engage the public and, and get greater understanding about the uh, risks and opportunities, in a sense, of these weapons? Um, and the fact that, you know, they are uh, uh, weapons that are fully, uh, in a sense, under uh, human control. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, the media being what it is, I mean, we had in our original AI um, House of Lords report, we had the, you know, lurid press articles about Terminator robots needing a uh, code of conduct and all this kind of thing. Well, you know, uh, if we got it for civilian use of AI, uh, if we're not careful, we're going to get these fears absolutely stoked up uh, when we uh, talk about, you know, meaningful human involvement and so on. So I think we've got to be quite measured in the way that we talk about this uh, and make sure that uh, we do emphasize that actually uh, international humanitarian law does require these weapons to have that meaningful human control. Um, uh, and I, and you know, we, that's, it, it's not easy to kind of reassure uh, 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 people at the same time as uh, um, coming out with a report like this, but I, I hope it will. And I'm sure that you'd agree that if the Ministry of Defence really wants, if the government really wants to democratise the process and to get public uh, reassurance and confidence in what's being done up to a higher level, um, the government has the, a very easy option of simply accepting all the recommendations we make in our report. Uh -huh, exactly, exactly. So I look forward to two months' time. <laughs> uh, so do I. <laughs> <laughs>